Okay, so get this, right? We are diving into this Philippines Supreme Court decision, and uh, it's a big one. It's huge. It went all the way to the top, dealing with, well, honestly, some really tough stuff. We're talking sexual assault against a minor. Yeah, you guys wanted us to really unpack the court's thinking on this one, especially because they overturned a lower court's acquittal. So, yeah, this is... This is heavy. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think it's important we do. So to set the scene a little bit, we have AAA, right. a minor. Yeah. She's accusing her stepfather, XXX, of sexually assaulting her. And we're talking multiple times. Multiple times. And you know what's crazy? What's crazy? The local court initially acquitted XX. Acquitted. 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 It's wild, right. But that's where the Supreme Court steps in. Now, remember, they're not retrying the entire case. Right. They're more like referees, you know. They're checking if the rules were followed, if the law was applied correctly, that sort of thing. It's all about due process. Okay, so they're checking if the refs down on the field missed a call. Basically. And in this case, oh, they found some fouls. Big time. Essentially, they said... The lower court really dropped the ball, leaning too heavily on what the accused was saying and not giving enough weight to AAA. To AAA's testimony. Yes. And to the medical evidence. So are you saying they basically just took the accused word for it? It's almost like that. And the Supreme Court called them out. They said, and I'm pulling directly from the decision here, the lower court erred in demanding an ideal witness overlooking the reality of trauma's impact on behavior. Right. They're acknowledging that trauma... It looks different on everyone. You can't just dismiss someone's experience because they don't fit some perfect mold of how a victim should act. It's so important. There's no one-size-fits-all response to trauma. Exactly. And legally speaking, this is huge. This case is like a crash course on how the court should be viewing evidence, especially in cases as sensitive as this. It's like they're saying, listen to the victims. Their stories matter. Especially when that victim is you know, going up against unimaginable pressure, even from their own family. Because, I mean, we see in the decision, AAA's own mother didn't support her. It's heartbreaking. It is. And it makes you think about how much courage it took for her to fight for justice while dealing with that kind of weight on her shoulders, to stand up and speak her truth when even her own family. Oh, wow. It's a lot. Okay, so we have this young girl fighting to be heard, a legal system, trying to navigate these incredibly complex issues. Where does it go from here? Well, this is where Philippine law on child abuse mm -hmm. and the specific penalties for these types of crimes, that's where it gets really interesting. So I bet you're thinking, okay, Philippine law, how does this affect me? Mm. But listen, the way this court tackled these legal details, it's like a masterclass in evidence and justice. It's relevant no matter where you are. Okay, I'm intrigued. Break it down for me. What were the big legal hurdles in this case? All right, so initially, XXX was charged with rape, straight up. But then when the Supreme Court really dug into the specifics, the evidence, while super serious, pointed more towards something else under Philippine law. Acts of lasciviousness. Acts of lasciviousness. Uh, okay, that sounds like, I don't know, something from a dusty law textbook. Can we get that in plain English? Yeah. Yeah, basically, it covers inappropriate, sexually charged actions that might not fit the exact legal definition of rape in this specific situation. I see. It's a separate category of sexual abuse. Still incredibly harmful, don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. And the penalties are severe. So the charges changed, but they weren't letting him off easy, were they? Absolutely not. The court was laser focused on justice for AAA. They made it clear that even though the initial charge was rape, the lower court should have considered these other charges based on what was right there in the evidence. So they weren't going to get bogged down by a technicality. Nope. They focused on what mattered. And this part is important for everyone listening, okay, mm -hmm. because it sets a precedent. It yeah. tells us that courts have a duty to look at the whole picture to ensure justice is served, even when it gets complicated. That's good. I like hearing that. Right. Okay, so they found XXX guilty of these acts of lasciviousness. What's the sentence? Well, this is where it gets interesting. The court looked at past cases, what we call precedents, to guide their decision. Oh. And they landed on a hefty prison sentence. They took into account the seriousness of his actions, the impact on AAA, the whole picture. I can only imagine the relief for AAA, you know, to have her voice heard, to see the system work, finally. It's powerful. You mentioned earlier how the Supreme Court found flaws in how the lower court handled her testimony. Mm -hmm. What did they specifically call out? So remember those harmful stereotypes we discussed? The lower court fell right into that trap. 
They questioned why AAA didn't scream during the assault. Yeah. They questioned why she didn't immediately tell her mother. Oh, come on. That is so frustrating. Like, there's a rule book for how you're supposed to react in those situations. Exactly. It makes no sense, and the Supreme Court knew that. They stated, and I quote, to demand that a victim of sexual assault must act according to a specific script not only defies reason and human experience, but also trivializes the trauma suffered. That is powerful. Powerful. They shut down that entire line of questioning. Good. Yeah. They said, and I love this part, trauma manifests differently in everyone. There's no right way to act. No textbook response. And the medical evidence? Oh, yeah. Another critical piece of the puzzle. They emphasized how the medical examination backed up AAA's story. This wasn't about emotions or accusations. It was about facts. They connected the dots. Testimonial evidence, physical evidence, boom. So you have this young girl, incredibly brave, sharing her truth. You have medical evidence supporting her. And then the Supreme Court steps in and basically says, hold up, lower court. Did you miss all of this? And more than that, they said, you didn't give us a single convincing reason to doubt her. It wasn't enough to just rely on the accused's denial. And this part is huge because it sets a standard. You can't just dismiss a victim's story without justification, without solid ground. You have to back it up. Which is how it should be. No. This isn't just about one case, one girl. It's about setting a precedent. Exactly. It affects how these cases are handled in the future. That's why we do this show, why we dive into these decisions. Yeah. This case, it's about so much more than just one family in the Philippines. It's about demanding a justice system that protects the vulnerable. That <clears throat> listens. It's like they say, justice for one is justice for all. What starts in a courtroom thousands of miles away speaks to everyone, to power, to justice, to finding your voice. You know, it's easy to get caught up in all the legal stuff, but at the heart of it, this is about courage. AAA's courage to speak up when it would have been easier to stay silent, it makes you think, how do we as a society respond to that courage, especially when someone's speaking out about abuse? It's huge. I mean, her bravery, mm -hmm. her refusal to be silenced, it goes way beyond this one courtroom, this decision. It sends a message to survivors. Yeah. You're not alone. What you say matters. Mm -hmm. Justice is possible. It's like this beacon of hope, right? The system, even with its flaws, can work. But there's also this challenge, I think. How do we make it so survivors are not just heard, but believed and supported right from the start? That's the big question, isn't it? And it's bigger than just laws and courtrooms. It's about changing the whole culture. We need to build an environment where survivors feel safe to come forward, knowing they won't be met with doubt, skepticism, all those harmful stereotypes we talked about. Gotta go. You got that right. It's like the court, they recognized those biases and they drew a line. Enough, they said. But dismantling those biases, that's on all of us. 100%. We all have a role to play here. It starts with education, with questioning those ingrained assumptions we have about how someone should act after experiencing something traumatic. We need to believe survivors, amplify their voices, and fight for systems that protect and empower them not the other way around. This deep dive, wow. We started with this court case, this family in the Philippines, and now we're talking about global change. It's incredible how connected it all is. Right. It shows the power of the law. Yeah. It's not just words on paper. It reflects who we are as a society, what we value, what we're willing to stand up for. And sometimes it takes a case like this, one person's fight, to shake things up, to push for progress, to remind us that justice is always worth fighting for, no matter how long it takes even when it feels impossible. I couldn't have said it better myself. This case, this is what it's all about. It's about the power of one voice to spark change. So as we wrap up, I wanna leave you with this. What can you do in your own life to be an advocate, to make a difference? Think about it. It's a question worth holding on to long after this conversation ends. Thanks for joining us.